See, that's the thing. Nobody really ever thinks that it'll happen to them. I mean, everything seems like it's fine. We spend all this time with them, getting to know them, becoming friends with them, and it seems perfectly normal, safe. You don't really ever believe the stories. Sure, you've heard about them, but nobody really believes them until it happens to you. And then everything you thought it, you knew about the world turns out to be wrong. Catastrophe. It's real. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Horror Movie Syllabus. My name is Professor Victor, and I'll be your host as we go through all of the essential, noteworthy, interesting, and notorious modern horror films. If you're new to the channel, I recommend you check out the introduction video. There's a link to it in the description below, and it'll give you a pretty good overview of what the horror movie syllabus is all about. But in short, we look at a particular subgenre of horror, and then we pick three movies from that subgenre to explore. Today, the subgenre that we're looking at is documentary horror. And if you're asking yourself, Professor, didn't we already cover this one? Uh, you're, you're onto something there because, uh, previously we did horror documentaries and I'll admit that the distinction between the two is a little semantic and a little bit nuanced, but I think it's justifiable. See, what we talked about previously with horror documentaries is documentary movies about horror films, whether they be behind the scenes stuff, a critical analyses, um, you know, fan theories about horror movies. They were documentaries you know, nonfiction movies about horror movies. In this case, what we're looking at is documentary horror. We're looking at documentaries about real life events that are horrifying, uh, horrific, uh, disturbing, uh, you know, things like that. Things, real life horror. Uh, and as a result, we're going to have a, um, an interesting time of it because while there's a lot of movies that can be covered under this subgenre, in fact, you know, documentary itself is, uh, a, any a kind of a catch-all for any kind of real life event that has some sort of uh tragedy or conflict or something like that so it's already kind of a broad area to to delve into this is enhanced further by the proliferation of the true crime genre uh which you know covers a lot of the same ground and and quite frankly we're going to talk a little bit of true crime in this video today but what really makes this a little you know uh, trepidatious, if you will, uh, for me is, is that some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today is, is a little bit touchy. Uh, you know, we're going to be looking at movies that are talking about abuse and, and, and harm to children, uh, self harm, sexual assault, uh, and real life stuff, not fictional stuff, not fictionalized. So I guess, you know, trigger warning I, for people who are pretty sensitive to that kind of stuff, maybe, Maybe this week's video is not the one. Maybe we skip this video if, if, if that's how we feel and, and just come back next week when we'll be talking about something far less touchy. Uh, and, and I, I ain't going to be mad at you if you do. Uh, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's just, just a heads up that some of the movies we're talking about today deal with some rough stuff. But here's the thing. Quality movies. Really interesting, fascinating movies. I remember when I was younger thinking uh, that I wasn't really that into documentaries because they were boring, right? I wanted to be entertained, it's like that. And I didn't realize that if you find documentaries that are about things that you're interested in, super fascinating, super intriguing. Uh, and and documentaries about real life horrors, it just it it appeals to a uh, I think the same thing that interests people in horror movies. Really, just kind of like this this kind of curiosity about the morbid and the, uh, you know, the kind of taboo or, or the scary or whatever kind of a way to confront our fears. But it's a little bit more visceral because it's real, because it's something that actually happened. And uh, I'm not the only one who feels this way. These are very popular. Uh, this is a very popular subgenre, very popular films. Uh, and most of these we're going to be talking about are pretty well known, I think, and pretty uh, well received. Uh, and what I, what I did is I kind of focused a little bit on documentaries that really played into the horror aspect of the subject matter, you know, where they, they kind of present the movie almost like a horror movie in and of itself. Uh, and we didn't, while not every movie is like that here, I did kind of give special attention to the movies that really focus on the entertainment aspect of the documentary, you know, trying to kind of thrill or titillate or intrigue the viewer by you know, presenting it kind of mysteriously, kind of creepily, you know, whether it be the music or the editing or whatever, uh, making it a kind of a horror type experience. Hence the distinction, documentary horror. It's kind of a 
a documentary that's a horror movie itself. So that's what we're looking at. That's the distinction. That's how we're going forward. And in this case, we're going to rank them like we always do. And we're going to rank them in order of how impactful they are, how how much of an impact they had on the public at large when they came out, uh, as well as uh, personal impact, like how it affects the viewer personally, what you, what, it, what it means individually. So this is going to be pretty interesting. I'm really excited about this one because some really great movies. But again, a little bit of a bumpy ride. If you have to check out, no problem. We'll catch up with you next week. Uh, but, but for the rest of you, uh, buckle up, man. Let's get into these documentary horror movies. The first documentary horror movie we're looking at today, the undergraduate level selection, is Cropsey. Cropsey came out in 2009 and is a pretty good example of what I was just talking about in that it's a documentary movie that really kind of tries to play up the spookiness of it, kind of play it like a little bit of a horror movie, really, you know, dealt with the music and the way it's put together, really kind of trying to give it a little bit of a creep factor and sell it as kind of a horror and, and upsell or uh, you know, highlight the horror, the real life horror they're going to talk about. Uh, and it really is a real life horror. It's a true crime story. So we're also getting our first true look at the true crime genre here uh, in this selection. But uh, it's a, a really interesting one because while it's true crime, it also plays up these horror elements really interestingly. So if you haven't seen it before, the movie is about a pair of filmmakers from Staten Island who discuss the Cropsey legend, the urban legend of a killer named Cropsey who hunts children. Uh, and as they do their documentary, they start to delve into the real life disappearance of a child in Staten Island and the man, Andre Rand, who was accused of kidnapping her uh, and, and went to jail for it and maybe was uh, also responsible for other children going missing. Or maybe he wasn't responsible or maybe he wasn't solely responsible. And that's where the mystery of the story goes. And of course, we'll stop there. So to not spoil it for everybody, even though, you know, these are the real stories. So they're out there. It's not like, you know, you can't just go and look this stuff up. But that's not really the point. You know, when you watch a documentary that you don't know the story about, it's, you know, a good thing not to spoil it. And so we're not going to do that here. And Cropsey is an intriguing movie to me because of the way that it starts and then the way it shifts its focus. It opens up as a documentary about the urban legend of Cropsey, which is something I'm pretty interested in because because yeah, I like the burning, frankly. And, you know, the burning folds the legend of Cropsey into it. Uh, and, and you know, we talked about that on the channel. Uh, but uh, then the movie shifts its focus. It goes from the urban legend and exploring how uh, kids would tell the story of Cropsey and how, you know, word of mouth would change the story over time and how the details shift, but the, the core remains the same. But then it shifts over to true crime. It, it talks about this this case of this young missing girl uh, who 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 disappeared in the the manhunt for her that ultimately led to a, a man named Andre Rand who's pretty darn creepy when you see him and it's understandable why people fixated on him and 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 blamed him and then it follows you know the investigation and the case and it folds in uh, other cases of missing children in the same area that may or may not be related to uh, Andre Rand. And it also talks a little bit about, you know, whether or not it was possible he actually didn't commit these crimes or at least didn't commit them alone. And the uh, unsettlingness of that that question, whether or not there's still people out there or uh, a different person out there who did this, who remains uncaught, is pretty spooky in and of itself. But also the exploration of how and why people want to, you know, for lack of a better word, pin it on Andre Rand. And I'm not saying he didn't do it, uh, but... But the idea that they want to solve the mystery, they want to solve the crime, they want to uh, basically, basically lock up the monster so they can feel safe again. And the, the juxtaposition of that against the Cropsey urban legends and the way the kids are afraid of Cropsey and the adults are afraid of real life terrors and want to just find a, a way to kind of sleep through the night by thinking, well, this guy's put away, he's in jail now. That's really interesting. And that's, you know, a great way to kind of tease out the the horror of the situation, the creepiness of the situation. And of course, the details are pretty creepy too as a young girl. And, and you know, there's uh, it's mostly left up to speculation as to what may have happened to her, you know, the, and, and the other victims uh, before and uh, they died and, and afterwards. Uh, you know, I know some of them maybe didn't die because not everybody has been found. Um, you know, again, I'm not trying to spoil things too much, but, but there is, uh, you know, a lot left up to the imagination because we just don't frankly know. Uh, Andre Rand never confessed this. He maintains his innocence. Uh, but the, 
the the movie is a really well made true crime documentary. It's actually one of my favorites, which is why we're talking about it here. Uh, but I do have to nitpick something, and that is that I think that the shift from the urban legend to the true life real crime thing is a really cool idea, but it doesn't go as smoothly as I would like. And I think what I would like is either a little bit more on the urban legend end of the story or have it kind of weave together a little better. It really does kind of go from one to the other. And I think you could have really weaved in the Cropsey urban legend throughout the movie and made it kind of feel a little bit more cohesive, a little bit more together. And I would have, you know, appreciated hearing a little bit more about that urban legend. In that sense, I feel like the movie maybe loses a little bit of a thread of its theme, just a little bit, but it's a minor nitpick because it still winds up being a very compelling uh, true crime documentary. And they do do a really good job with the music and with the editing and with the footage that they find to give the movie a certain feel, a certain creep factor, a certain, you know, you turn the lights down and watch this movie, it could give you the willies, you know? I mean, it's not going to, you know, scare you the way, you know, like something kind of like The Exorcist or something would do or, you know... Uh, the descent or something it's not going to give you really jump scares exactly but it is going to give you that unsettling feeling the thing that i tend to appreciate when it comes to horror so this movie works for me very very well there's a good chance a lot of you have seen this movie before or at least familiar with it uh, and if you are go ahead in the comments let me know what you think of it too but i am pretty high on this one it is one i would recommend if you're a true crime lover and you haven't seen this movie i would definitely highly recommend it uh but even if you're not super into true crime maybe give this one a chance too because i i, I think that it, it, the vibe is good i think the vibe's got a little bit of a horror vibe to it it is a pretty good illustration of what i'm talking about in terms of trying to make the documentary horror a little bit more like an entertainment as well as an inform uh and, and so I, I really like this one so uh check it out if you haven't let me know what you think the next documentary horror movie that we're looking at today the graduate level selection is paradise lost the child murders at robin hood hills paradise lost came out in 1996 and is a pretty well-known famous series of documentaries there's actually three of them we're going to mostly focus on the first one today, but it's pretty well known. And the case that it's based on about the West Memphis Three is pretty well known as well. It's gotten a lot of exposure. It's got a lot of media attention. It's got a lot of celebrity attention. And we're going to talk about all that in just a minute. First, if you haven't seen it before, the documentary focuses on the West Memphis Three, three teenage boys who were accused and convicted of murdering three uh you know preteen children uh, uh in the woods and uh doing some really horrific mutilation of them and uh allegations of satanic cult worshiping and satanic rituals and, uh, abounded in there uh based maybe largely in part because these were weird kids who liked to wear black and liked heavy metal music and so the case focuses on the perspective of both the, the surviving parents as well as the con the accused and convicted uh, uh killers uh and and then you know whether or not the the, the case holds water and all the doubts that are about that uh but we'll stop there uh, again to not spoil it even though again this is a pretty well known one the west memphis three that's what they call them that gives you an idea right there of of how uh well known and well established this this, this story is and it's a very compelling one there's a reason why it, it caught uh the attention of everybody and that's because of a the gruesomeness of the crimes and forewarned the movie opens with video from the crime scene of the bodies it's very unsettling and that's how it starts so be aware of that. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily get much easier as they describe what happened to these, these, these kids. And they're young kids, they're eight or nine years old, like under 10, something like that. I don't remember the exact ages off the top of my head, but, uh, the, 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 the weird thing is that when you switch to the, the accused teenagers, they, they do a pretty good job of presenting them as real people, which I feel like doesn't happen a lot of the time in, in, in movies especially, but also in documentaries, uh, the, the, the accused or the killer or whatever tends to get vilified or, or being shown as a monster. And these guys are shown as kids, you know, just kind of dumbass kids, really. And, and I say that because sometimes they say stuff that they really probably shouldn't be saying. It doesn't really necessarily mean they're guilty and or doesn't even necessarily even hint at their guilt, but it doesn't make them look good. And, and I like that they just kind of showed that honestly. And I do think that while the, the documentary does seem to kind of have a slant in terms of how they feel about things, uh, especially as the series goes on, I do think they do a good job of trying to present everything and put all the information on screen to let people kind of make their own decisions which in these kind of true crime style movies documentaries is kind of part of the fun is kind of trying to 
Figure out how you feel about it. What do you think? Do you believe they did it or not? And this movie does a really, really good job of it. Now, uh, uh, I do, again, think it kind of has a slant because it really has led a lot of people to believe that they've been wrongly convicted. And there's a lot of details, and I won't go into them because they're in the movie, uh, that really hint at why people would think that they are uh, uh, not not the right people who did the crime, that somebody else did it. And uh, the interesting thing about it that the movie really kind of brushes up on is, uh, uh, is well, if they didn't do it, who did? Because uh, that means they'd still be out there. And and that's the thing, you know, it's like, first of all, what if these are the kids, what if these kids didn't do it? And then if they didn't, who did? That's pretty creepy. That's pretty scary. And and it really kind of leans into that. Uh, and once again, it's it's doing a really good job by presenting really amazing footage it's they've gotten amazing footage uh of, again crime scene courthouse uh jailhouse interviews uh it's really fascinating the information that is presented via video footage they have they really are showing everything and they've edited it together in a way that again presents a really great compelling mystery and gives it a certain vibe which is coupled with uh, or enhanced by the soundtrack which is done by Metallica. Metallica allowed the filmmakers to use their music for this movie because the boys were big Metallica fans and Metallica not for nothing doesn't really usually do this is like the first time that they let people use their music for a movie uh, so that was saying something about not only the high profileness of the case but also uh, the public opinion about the West Memphis Three. People were willing to publicly kind of get behind them. High-profile people, famous people. It gives you an idea of where the general consensus is. And and it's interesting because, you know, again, it presents some of the, the, the parents uh, and other townspeople who are against, you know, these boys wanting to get them convicted. But also it follows their thought process as facts come out and, and how they're feeling about the case too and what their thoughts are going forward. Interesting stuff. Really interesting to see perspective shift, to see things happen. And then the sequels, uh, I think part two is called Revelations, part three is called, I think, Purgatory. Uh, they're good, too, because they continue the story as the case goes through the courts and appeals and things like that. As time passes on, as the boys grow up and, 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 and get older, and, and as more facts come out about the case, it goes further and further and keeps following the story. Really, really compelling to see where it ends up, because... I don't want to spoil too much, but the, in the third movie, they're, they're feeling it, thinking one thing's going to happen, and then something else happens that's pretty surprising, and so they had to completely change where they were going with the documentary, which, you know, kind of what happens in a documentary, I guess, but really interesting to watch all three. They're not short. The first one itself is well over two hours, I think, and uh, uh, but they're very much worth a watch. They're very well made, and like I said, they're very well known. They they are very uh, popular. They have a lot of critical acclaim. Uh, and I think the third one I might have gotten nominated for an Oscar because I think the first two were not theatrically released. But uh, they are very great examples of not only really well-made, well-researched true crime documentary, but also uh, uh, the power that a really good documentary has to affect a ch change, affect a change in perception, a change in you know, public feeling, uh, and a change in policy even. Uh, you know, things can happen that can change the course of somebody's life because of the documentary and shining a light on the subject matter. So it's definitely one that has a lot of impact, and, and, but it's also just a really, really good watch. So again, if you like true crime, you've probably already seen this one, frankly, but if not, hurry up and check it out. But even if you haven't, it's a fascinating story, a little gruesome, be forewarned, but if you haven't checked it out, do so and let us know what you think. And the third documentary horror movie we're looking at today, the postgraduate level selection, is Dear Zachary, A Letter to a Son About His Father. Dear Zachary came out in 2008 and is a notorious documentary. Uh, it is very well known amongst, at least amongst the horror crowd, uh, and probably beyond that as well, as being an incredibly powerful, uh, rather shocking, and terribly sad documentary. It is a... Uh, a real gut punch of a movie and, and if you've heard anything about the movie that's probably what you've heard about is how incredibly sad it is and given the subject matter of it what it's about the, the framework of the documentary it's very very easy to see why but if you don't know anything about it watch it watch it and and, and find out don't look anything up because uh it, it goes some places that shouldn't be spoiled and we're going to do our best to not spoil it here but if you haven't seen it the movie is the story of a documentary filmmaker deciding to make a documentary about his childhood best friend who he grew up with who has been murdered by his ex-girlfriend. Uh, and 
then subsequently finds out that the ex-girlfriend that murdered him is pregnant with the child with his child and so he makes the documentary uh, initially essentially a, a way to like learn more about his best friend that things he didn't know about uh, from other friends of his and family stories he hadn't heard and then it becomes a, a quite literal a video letter to the unborn child who gets born later on uh, a, 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 basically telling him about his father, a man he will never get a chance to meet and all the good things and all the great memories that people have about him. And just from that premise alone, you can understand why this winds up being incredibly sad. Uh, it, it, that is just a tragic uh, idea. You know, it's a beautiful idea, but it's a tragic idea. And it's a great hook for a documentary. Uh, it's a great way to focus a documentary. And what I like about it is that, you know, in this case, the documentary filmmaker puts himself very much into the movie because it is about his best friend and they had a relationship. And one of the things that's nice about it is this filmmaker has wanted to be a filmmaker since he was a kid. So even as a kid, he was making these home movies uh, with his buddy. His name is Andrew, the guy who got killed. Uh, and so he's got all this amazing footage of them when they were young, when they were children, when they were teenagers. He's got all this footage of him doing stuff and just being a kid and being a personality uh, and it's really wonderful and it's just a, a very valuable treasure to have for for Andrew's family and his son Zachary hence the name uh it's just really wonderful and it's kind of heartwarming but also very bittersweet too and you know the way that the filmmaker puts it in I think his name's Kurt is that he 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 met all these people, friends of his of, of his friend Andrew, during the memorial service that he had never met before. People that had worked with him as a doctor across the country and stuff like that. Uh, and he's hearing stories about him that he didn't know. And that's what inspires him initially to explore the life of his best friend and just kind of like make one last movie with him. And just, just saying it is so sad. Like it makes me want to be sad right now just saying that. And it's a great start. And then... As you know, because you know, the movie's told kind of chronologically, uh, uh, when they find out that the, the woman that killed Andrew is pregnant, that shifts the focus of the movie to being a, a you know, a, a, a video for this child telling him all the stuff about his father. And they do a really great job of not just humanizing a victim here, but also like showing how loved he was. And they even make a point of saying it in the documentary how when people die, people don't speak ill of them. They always speak really highly of them and say good things and, and but in this case they're all true and you really get that vibe you get that sense that this guy was just an incredibly lovable nice good man that was tragically taken away and and you feel that pain you feel the pathos in this it really does a great job of capturing that emotion in no small part because it's a personal story. The documentarian has a personal connection. This is his friend. And, you know, he's narrating the documentary. And there are a couple moments where he gets a little choked up talking about it. And he left it in there. He didn't really, uh, he didn't re-record re anything like that. And it's great. It really helps you to connect and feel the loss. Uh, but it also because it's just, he edits the hell out of this thing. It is, and it's been praised for its editing. It's been praised for a lot of things. It's gotten a lot of good critical acclaim, but the editing is very, very good. Very funny at times. It does a really good job of just doing some smash cuts that are really funny, but it also does some smash cuts that punch you in the gut. You know, it has some ones where, like, for example, when he's talking about the uh, the autopsy report and how, how his friend was shot and where he was shot, and it's cutting to baby photos uh, of, of his of his friend Andrew when he's talking about the grisly uh, you know details of the murder uh, really really powerful you know uh, and the way he weaves the friends and especially the family into the movie in particular the the mother and father the parents of Andrew the grandparents of Zachary is amazing because a they're incredible people b uh, the story takes some crazy shifts and I don't want to spoil the whole movie for you but one of them is this woman who has killed their son. Uh, is Canadian. She's moved back to Canada. She kills him in the U.S. and moves back to Canada. And then they find out she's pregnant. So, you know, mom and pa go and move to Canada to her town so they can be near their grandson, the last living connection they're going to have to their son who's dead. And they have to make nice with the woman who killed him while she awaits extradition uh, hearings so that they can see the grandson. And it's insane. And you understand why they would do this because they're putting the grandson first. But it's just like, how? How do you do that? And the movie goes into this and it's amazing. I'm not going to go any farther than that, but like, it's an amazing documentary that just goes places you're not expecting it to go and, and tells a story that, quite honestly, if you, if you pitched this as a fictional story, like a movie, 
people think, no, it's kind of too ridiculous. It's too ridiculous. There's just no way. Uh, so the fact that it's real and it's this insane is, um, it's something else. It's an experience, but it's not an easy experience. Uh, like I said, and this is less about like trigger warning stuff and more just because it's incredibly sad. It's shocking, but it's incredibly sad. Uh, it really does a great job of manipulating your feelings. And I don't say that in a negative way. I say that in a positive way. It's a really wonderfully made film. Uh, the documentarian filmmaker tipped my hat to him because he is doing a masterful job of, like I said, manipulating your emotions. But I don't think, again, in a nefarious way, I think he's trying to make you feel what it's like to lose his friend, Andrew. And I think he accomplishes it. And uh, again, I don't want to spoil the movie too much, so I can't go into it too, too, too much, but uh, the movie does highlight changes that were made, policy changes that were made uh, in light of the events of this movie and, and how uh, this documentary helped shine a light on some flaws in law that needed to be fixed and, and, and how... You know, people can come together and help each other to make sure bad things uh, that, like what happened in the movie don't necessarily happen again or, or the chances of them happening again are greatly reduced. Uh, it's really powerful stuff, really kind of a must-see. If you like true crime, you should have already seen this one. It's, 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 it's a masterpiece of filmmaking. It's a masterpiece of a documentary. Uh, and and, and it originally supposed to be uh, something that was just made for the family and friends, not something that was to be made public at all. And then because of events, uh, they decided to release it publicly and thank God they did so the rest of us can experience it. But it is an experience. So if you haven't seen it, be aware. Super sad. Plan your day around it, you know. Uh, you know, maybe have a, a palate cleanser right afterwards. Watch, you know, uh, I don't know, Coraline or something ever I don't know uh, something a little more upbeat gremlins uh so you can bring yourself back up a little bit because it's a bit of a downer of a movie but it is a ride that is worth it uh from a filmmaking perspective it's great from an emotional perspective it is outstanding uh and from a true crime slash uh, real life story event it is heartbreaking and shocking and and just uh must be seen to be believed so high recommend definitely check that one out So those are our selections for the documentary horror subgenre, but obviously I have a few extra credit movies to talk about because, like I said, there's so many good movies that I was actually having a hard time whittling it down for this one. Uh, but I think I found some that I, I really wanted to talk about that are pretty interesting and maybe not all the most mainstream movies. Maybe some of them are. I don't know. We'll find out. The first one we're going to talk about is called The Nightmare. And Nightmare came out in 2015, and let's be clear, this is the documentary called The Nightmare, because there's a lot of movies that are called The Nightmare or something close to that. This is the 2015 U.S. documentary, because there's a 2015 German movie also, so getting the, 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 the right movie can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge, but, uh, you know, here's the, 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 the cover of it, and it is the movie, uh, that is about sleep paralysis stuff. So hopefully that can help you zero in on the right one. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, you can see the right one. The movie is, again, about uh, sleep paralysis and in particular uh, follows a, a handful of subjects who suffer from sleep paralysis and it dramatizes uh, their experiences, their stories. They tell these stories about having sleep paralysis incidents uh, and like the visions that they experience and the physical aspects of what happened to them. And the movie uh, dramatizes those. They have like these little vignettes uh, that kind of dramatize this in a very... Uh, I don't know, Hollywood horror movie kind of way that, you know, kind of gives the viewer an impression of how scary it would be to go through these experiences and deal with the sleep paralysis demons. And it also explores a little bit how the similarities between the stories from people who don't know each other and how they all seem to experience the same kind of visions or similar visions and similar ideas, uh, you know, hinting at whether or not it really is purely a medical condition or if there is something more sinister or possibly uh, supernatural going on. And I'll stop there. So it's not spoil the movie for you, although the movie isn't exactly narrative in nature. It really is. Like I said, it's kind of like a bunch of vignettes of people telling their stories. And uh, the movie does a really good job of highlighting the similarities and how there is like through lines and in, in, in the details uh, that match up in all these different disparate stories. It works really, really well. Uh, and, and it's enhanced by the the dramatization because they, they're using similar filming techniques, similar looking demons, if you will, uh, for the movie. So you're seeing a little bit of how these things kind of all seem to be the same or similar coming from the same place. Uh, and, and the movie is kind of trying to 
push towards an idea that a hint towards a supernatural notion, you know, kind of dismissing the medical explanation of this. And that's driven in large part by the subjects themselves. They really seem to believe that there is something more to the sleep process than just a physiological, psychological condition. They really seem to be uh, under the idea or notion that there might be something, a real demon, uh, a real supernatural type thing happening to them. And uh, that's fine. That's great. I just kind of wish there was a counterpoint in the movie. I wish there was somebody, you know, a doctor or something like that, some sort of expert to kind of give the counterpoint of what is actually happening physiologically in the brain, etc., in the body to to give a counterpoint to the people who kind of going, you know, like, this is a demon. You know, I need Jesus to save me, you know. Uh, I think that would have given the documentary a little bit more balance and a little bit more weight because as a result, it just winds up being uh, a series of people telling their kind of spooky stories. Uh, and it makes sense when you realize that the filmmaker who made The Nightmare also made Room 237, uh, the documentary about Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, uh, which is basically a bunch of people telling their kind of crackpot uh, fan theories about the meaning of the movie and all the weird messaging going on and stuff like that. Uh, we talked about that movie when we talked about horror documentaries. Uh, and I love that movie. I think it's great. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, and this movie has a similar notion where he's kind of given, uh, and I'm going to say this loosely, he's given crackpots the ability to tell their stories and kind of dramatizing them and having fun. Uh, and, and I don't, I'm not mad at that because he is really leaning into what we were talking about earlier in that he's remembering to entertain with the movie. He's trying to make a documentary that's kind of a horror movie. You know, he's got, it's got horror scenes in it, and they're pretty effective. They're pretty creepy. Uh, you know, he does a good job as the dramatizations, you know, play out of creeping people out, doing these images and these uh, these shots that, that are really unsettling, really pretty pretty creepy. So, you know, I, that's what he's going for. And if you know him from New, Room 237, you understand he's not really trying to give you a fair, balanced, informative documentary. He's trying to entertain, and he's succeeding at that. And so that's why I picked this one is he really is the best example uh, of all the movies we're talking about today of trying to just make an entertaining, fun documentary that kind of spooks you out and and gives you some information at the same time. But he's not really worried about, you know, fair and balanced facts or anything like that. Uh, and, and that's perfectly fine, uh, you know, but I do think it would have been enhanced to get that counterpoint. I think the movie would have felt more balanced, more interesting, have a little more meat on the bone because... Again, from a documentary standpoint, it's a little bit thin. But from a fun horror movie documentary standpoint, it's pretty good. And it was pretty well received when it came out. People really appreciated that horror movie aspect of it. The creepy movie, uh, the creepy vignettes uh, showing the, the, the sleep paralysis incidents, uh, the jump scares. This is a movie that actually does have jump scares in it uh, for a documentary that's pretty funny. Uh, and, and just a really good job of the way the editing and the music and everything like that to deliver the creeps, to deliver the thrills. Uh, and so I wanted to shine a light on this one, even though, like I said, it's pretty well known, pretty well received, and you've probably seen it if you're into these kind of movies. But if you haven't, yeah, give it your time. It's not a bad watch it's not a long watch uh and let me know what you think of it the next extra credit movie i'm going to mention is called the bridge the bridge came out in 2006 and is a documentary about the golden gate bridge so again if you uh there's a lot of movies called the bridge or something like that so make sure you find the right one but here's where i'm going to reiterate a, a, a trigger warning for people because this movie is about suicide it's about people jumping off the golden gate bridge so uh if uh if this is a problem for you i'll put a timestamp uh so you can just like skip this movie entirely and jump to the next one if you're if that's an issue for you because it's it's this one's real 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 touchy real touchy now, if you haven't seen it and you want to know what it's about, the movie uh, is a documentary film crew who decided to film the Golden Gate Bridge for a whole year because of a, an article that was talking about how many people jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. It's one of, if not the most popular places for people to commit suicide. And they filmed for a year and there were 24 suicides of people jumping off the bridge during that calendar year. And they managed to capture 23 of them on camera and they show them. And in the movie, they show all of them in the movie, some of them from far away, uh, from a wide angle lens, some of them very close up from a telephone lens. It is pretty shocking, pretty upsetting, pretty disturbing and and, and very, very, very controversial. Uh, but we'll stop there and, and we'll get into some of this a little bit. But this movie is an interesting one. And I debated whether or not to include it here, but I ultimately decided to because of how notorious it is. Uh, and it's notorious for the obvious reason, uh, showing suicides live on camera. Uh, it, it comes off 
uh, pretty exploitative. Uh, you know, people looking at that and saying that that's really grim and really gruesome and really inappropriate. Uh, and then there are other people who look at what they are shining a light on in terms of, uh, you know, suicidal people and the people that get left behind because they're interviewing the loved ones of the people that committed suicide in the movie. And they say, well, that's kind of maybe doing some positive things. And, and I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think both of these things are true. Um, one of the things that is really great about the movie, but also a little problematic for me, is that they do interview the the, the surviving loved ones of the people who, who, who passed away. And they didn't tell them at the time that they interviewed them that they had footage of their loved ones jumping. And so that's a little weird to me. But on the flip side... Uh, they do claim that they got permission, uh, for, or, or, or not permission, but they that all the people uh, who took part in the documentary who were on the camera uh, were okay with it. They'd seen the movie. They were okay with it. I don't know if that's true. I really don't. I can tell you that the movie starts off with somebody jumping, and, and, and we're not going to show jumps in the video, just so you know. Um, but it's pretty shocking. It's, it's it, it, right off the bat. It's pretty shocking and upsetting. And... Uh, you know, it, it, I watched this whole movie trying to decide how I felt about it because I watched it because it, it seems so grim and taboo. I had to check it out. I really wasn't sure how I felt about it because on the one hand, you're seeing this stuff, you're seeing death. It's like a snuff film, basically. On the other hand, you know, especially when doing the research for the movie, um, you know, you're finding out that they did manage to save a few jumpers. I think it was six different jumpers. In fact, they show some of them in the movie being saved. A couple of them were people that they called, you know, help for, and, and police were able to get there and stop them from jumping in time. One of them was a, a woman who gets saved by a by a photographer who happens to be on the on the an unaffiliated photographer who happens to be on the bridge. Uh, it's shocking because he's got these uh these photos of her climbing over the railing. They're, they're harrowing shots, and they show them in the movie. Uh, but he manages to save her at the last minute, and it's. It's a, it's a it's a it's a cathartic feeling to see it on film because they've got it on film of him saving her and he they talked to him about how he felt and how the camera gave him this attachment he's taking photos and it's like he felt detached like a National Geographic photographer and it had to click in him what was happening so he could actually act because he was like just so detached from it which kind of makes me feel like that's probably how the filmmakers felt watching these things happen filming these things happening there's probably a level of detachment going on but one of the things that I thought was really positive about the movie was they showed they had, they had an interview of a guy who actually survived which is like a two percent chance of happening it's pretty rare that somebody can jump off this bridge and survive because it's like basically hitting concrete at like 70 miles an hour when you jump off the bridge uh and so he survived through the you know grace of god as he puts it and it's a really shocking and impressive and touching story to hear him he's a young man talking about how when he jumped he changed his mind and he felt like the things that he thought were so insurmountable weren't such a big deal anymore. But at this point, he couldn't take it back. And all he could do was try to hit the water in a way that he might not die. And he managed to do that. Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't perfectly fine after that. It was a, you know, rough recovery. But it's an interesting story that they shine a light on. And it's something that apparently is a pretty common uh, uh, feeling for people who manage to survive these kind of suicide attempts. They change their mind after they jump. They, they don't want to do it. But of course, it's too late to take it back. And I think pointing that out and showing that is important uh, and it's an important message that look these things don't don't work out the way that you want them to uh they don't solve your problems and your problems aren't as bad as you think i like that message um but the movie doesn't hit on it very hard and that's one thing that is both a pro and a con about the movie is that it's devoid of commentary it really is it's showing the footage and it's showing people talking about their loved ones there's no narrative coming from the documentary filmmakers uh they are just presenting the footage and uh, it's interesting because they show that a lot of the people that jump don't look like they're going to jump. You know, you'd think they'd be like, crying and sad and everything like that. And some of them are. Um, but some of them don't look that way. They look perfectly normal. And then they jump. And it's it's interesting to, to shine a light on that. And it's interesting to see uh, the conversations with the people who've been left behind and how so many of them just seem to have this this resignation about it. And it doesn't seem like it's that long after the event has happened that they're talking to these people and their attitudes almost seem, frankly, almost a little blasé. It's a little disturbing. Like these surviving family members and friends almost seem a little detached by it all. Some of them do get a little emotional uh, and are a little angry or a little whatever, but so many of them, like there's a, there's a mother and father of a, a young boy who committed suicide. They seem 
so casual about it. And they, and they address it in the movie too. They, 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 those people address how people must think it's weird. But it's just like, it's interesting to see how people process this. And, and I thought that that was one of the most fascinating things to me about the movie was how, how these um, surviving family members and friends were processing it. And, and the way they, they were written, it was not at all what I expected. And I think that's the thing about this movie in general. It's not at all what you expect it to be. It's neither as salacious and exploitative as the premise would make you think. And it's also not as sensitive or, or um, you know, uh, kids glovey as you would hope or expect uh, or, or think it should be. It really is kind of blunt and just like, here's what happens. Here's what people say about it. Here's what happens. Here's what people say about it. Here's what happens. And uh, if nothing else, captivating. Like, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Like, it's it's a hard watch, and it, obviously not for everybody. That's why I said some people just flat out skip it. Skip even hearing about it. But uh, for, 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 for those of you who are morbidly curious, it is seemingly playing up to that morbid curiosity, but it really isn't. If, if, if you're going in expecting, you know, gruesomeness, it's like that, you're going to probably be a little disappointed in that sense. Uh, but there is this unsettling feeling that what you're watching maybe is, it shouldn't be watched we should be like private or something like that but also you can understand the value in making it public and shining a light on it and and you know letting people know this is how things go you know this is you know why why are why is somebody jumping off putting a bridge literally every other week literally every other week and you know why aren't they putting up suicide barriers and stuff like that you know they don't address this they let you come to it yourself you know, they don't say and they show you the rails and how easy they are to get over. They don't make a point of this. They 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 have some some little you know thing at the end uh, talking about you know all the people that died, but that's that's about it in terms of commentary. It's really just out there for you. So this one, uh, I'm not exactly recommending it. I'm just shining a light on it. It's out there. It's super notorious. People know about it. A little hard to find sometimes, but watch at your own risk. But I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about this one. Ultimately, I think I fall on the line on the side of like uh, it being a, a positive thing. But I understand if some people disagree with me on that one. And the last extra credit movie I'm going to mention is Wisconsin Death Trip. Wisconsin Death Trip came out in 1999 and is a little bit of a different vibe from all of the other movies on this list. Uh, and you'll see why when we get into it. But it's definitely, uh, while dealing, again, with, with true facts uh, and macabre subject matter, uh, it's not... It's not nearly as touchy as, uh, as 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 the bridge is in that regard. So a little bit smoother sailing in this regard uh, by far. Uh, but we're going to get into this in just a minute. First, if you haven't seen it before, the movie is a docudrama uh, that recreates incidents that were reported on in Wisconsin in the 1890s. A series of events over the, that decade that uh, were very strange, macabre, uh, kind of gruesome, violent, uh, and, and, and mysterious, and 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 sh you know, just weird. Uh, and and it dramatizes them, and it's narrated by Ian Holm, uh, and and kind of given like this very strange, uh, almost ethereal, dreamlike vibe. It's all shot in beautiful black and white, and just these gorgeous recreations uh, with the, the slow narration that gets increasingly creepier as the movie goes on, and just has these kind of this thread of of like how how horrible things happen and they still are happening uh and then we'll leave it there not to spoil the movie too much but the movie really can't be spoiled it's really just a series of vignettes some of which are through lines that get carried throughout the movie other that are others that are just kind of one-off events of strange things are happening and and some of them are very very gruesome but the the docudrama aspect of it where they're they're kind of doing recreations and everything like that it pulls its punches it's not the like, gory you know, super gory or disturbing thing like that. It's the, it's honestly, it's the narration that's the more disturbing part. Ian Holm does this really great job of giving it a certain gravitas and a certain creep factor that works for me. And, and he's very successful in lining up with these, these images, which are powerful images. You know, it's, like I said, it's shot somewhat surreally. It's all in black and white and, and, you know, it, it has these very stark, wintry images or, or just really powerful, creepy angles and shadows and, and, these performances by people who aren't really speaking dialogue, uh, and 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 again punctuated by these you know newspaper accounts uh, that were taken from the time period, really a fascinating project, and and for the most part very very effective. Where I had an issue with it, and and, and doing the research on the movie for this video, uh, I'm not the only one, is that it intersperses uh, modern day footage in color with these vignettes from the 1890s. Uh, and it's jarring, A, because, again, it's color, and it's just, it looks aesthetically completely different. 
and then B, because what they're trying to do is underscore the notion that these murders and, and awful things that happened in the 1890s are still happening today. It, the same stuff is happening. Things have not changed. Things have not improved. It's the same. Great. Uh, but I don't think you need the modern day footage to hammer that point home. You really don't. And like I said, the big thing about this movie, the big like positive point, the big selling point of this movie is its aesthetic. It's a gorgeous movie. It is beautifully shot. Uh, but these these color inserts, not so much. They're just very flat, basic documentary stuff. They're the little self-important feeling. And, like all the slow-mo and cool angles and stuff like that that looks so good in the uh, the docudrama black and white recreations just feel very like showy and kind of ham-fisted to me in the in the in the color modern uh parts of the movie uh so i really wish they hadn't done that part of it uh it does kind of take me out of it and again uh, reading criticism for the movie which is positive uh this is the thing that people kind of knock it down for is this aspect of it but when you're in the docudramas when you're in the black and white portions of the movie it's great it's beautiful it's it's languid and and there, i guess if there's another knock i have in the movie it's this as the movie goes on it, it just kind of gets a little repetitive you know it's it's macabre thing after macabre thing after macabre thing and it just gets it kind of gets the same it lulls you into i don't want to say it's asleep because i don't think that's the case at all uh, but it lulls you into the sense of repetition and familiarity that that never and it never shakes you from that i guess the color inserts are supposed to be the thing that shake you from that but uh, th that just kind of annoyed me. I actually always wanted to get back to the docudrama stuff, and uh, it, it's 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 just it's uh, it's almost hypnotic. Uh, and th th there's a pro and a con to that. The pro is it does give you this like feel, this like I don't know um, mesmerizing feel of like being transplanted in time and being told these stories. Like it's almost like you're having visions of the past uh, that are narrated by Ian Holm. It's it's really very cool and effective. But the movie's kind of long. And so it, 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 after a little while, you're like, okay, I'm good. I want something else to happen or we need to wrap this up. You know, so it goes, it overstays its welcome a little bit. And I think if you maybe cut the color portions out, the movie would be shorter uh, and maybe you wouldn't feel that way. You wouldn't get to that point. I don't know, possibly. And I think it's possibly also because the stories don't ramp up. It's not like they get increasingly more disturbing or anything like that. Ian Holm does his part. He tries to make his... Uh, his narration kind of escalate into creepier and creepier and more urgent and more stressful sounding tones. But, uh, and God bless him for it because it does have some effect, but not enough. Uh, you know, when you're bound by facts and you're just reporting, you know, strange things happening, and the point is that strange things keep happening forever, even to this day, then it just kind of has a flat. There's no arc, there's no crescendo, there's no uh, climax to the movie. It just kind of happens. And there's a, like I said, there's a, there's a part of that too. It just kind of is a, it's almost relaxing. It's almost a relaxing movie to watch, uh, even though it's like got really disturbing stuff and some really horrible stories in there. But again, they're stories, uh, they're real life stories, but you're just hearing them so much as not, you know, really seeing awful things happening. They do have uh, pictures, real life pictures interspersed in the movie. I, I should mention this. And some of them might be a little disturbing, you know, like, you know, children who have passed away and things like that, but they're not gruesome. They're not gory or anything like that. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a really interesting film project. It's very like kind of avant-garde, very um, very film student-y kind of thing in a good way. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's artistic and, and, and ambitious and trying something that I, I can't think of any other documentaries that I've seen, at least, that have tried to do this and really is creating something fascinating and interesting for documentary horror, but a little bit slow, make some missteps along the way, uh, might overstay its welcome. So those are my caveats to the movie. Uh, I'm betting a lot of you haven't seen this one. This one doesn't seem to be as widespread. It's a little hard to find. It's out of print. Uh, so maybe not everybody has seen it before, but uh, it does have its reputation in certain circles. So uh, if you haven't seen it and you can find it, I would definitely say check it out. Just be aware of the caveats that I mentioned, but it's definitely worth your time because it's a gorgeous movie. It's just really, really well made, uh, at least the black and white parts. So uh, definitely worth the time at least in that regard. But I'd be curious to hear what you think of it if you've seen it before, because like I said, I've got mixed emotions about it myself and I'm betting a lot of you will too. So that's going to do it for our exploration into documentary horror movies. Uh, as you can see, I'm pretty in, in, enthusiastic about these movies. I think they're really, really good. I think there's a, a lot to be learned from them. And there's also just a lot of entertainment to be gained from them. Uh, the bridge being maybe <laughs> one that's not super entertaining. But, oh, you know, we, we already covered that. We're not getting into it again. Uh, and, and now it's time to get into a horror trivia pursuit card because it's that time where I read a question live on camera. 
uh, and see if I can answer it or if I'm going to embarrass myself. And the let's go with the, uh, the psychological uh, uh, the category on the card because uh, a lot of these documentaries are hitting you in the psychological bone rather than in like a monster bone or anything like that. So here's the question. For what agency does a friend of the protagonist, Chris Washington, work for in 2017's Get Out? And I know the answer to this question. And uh, I, I would not have known the name Chris Washington. I'll tell you that right now. I would have said Daniel Kaluuya. Because uh, Daniel Kaluuya is, is, the, is, the, is the actor who plays Chris in the movie. And I know exactly the person they're talking about here. Uh, and I'm prattling, of course, to give you some time. But, you know, they're talking about Lil Ray Howery's character in the movie, his best friend in the movie. And they're asking what agency they play for. And if you've seen Get Out there's like a real strong, strong chance that you'd know the answer to this question because it's it's a pretty uh, highlighted uh, plot point or a fact in the movie. It's addressed multiple times in the movie. They they don't shy away from it. It's not like a an Easter egg type thing. It's it's a, a pretty uh, defining characteristic of Lil Ray Harry's character, uh, whose name I don't remember off the top of my head. It might have been Rod. I'm not sure. Uh, I think Rod. Don't quote me. Um, but uh, yeah, I love Get Out. We've talked about it before. And, you know, uh, at the time of this recording, we've been talking a lot about Black Horror and I've thought about Jordan Peele specifically. Uh, so it kind of feels a little bit fresh. Uh, well, we weren't talking about Get Out specifically uh, in the last few videos. We were talking about Jordan Peele. So Get Out's been on my mind a little bit. Uh, so this, this feels like a timely question to me. Uh, at the time that you're watching this, it might not feel that way. But uh, but for me, it feels very timely. So I'm on this question. And I think I've given you guys enough time. Like either you know this or you don't. And I guess you could take a guess. If you're looking for a name of an agency. Take a guess. Sure. If you don't know, take a guess. But lock that guess in right now because I'm about to answer my question here. And my answer to the question, what agency did the friend work for? It is... The T.S. mother A. He is a TSA agent uh, and he works at the airport and it is something he repeats ad nauseum. He's very proud of it. And it lands, leads itself to a very fun gag towards the end of the movie. Uh, but let's just double check the card to make sure. The Transportation Security Administration or known as the TSA and it should say the TSMFA. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you know exactly why I'm saying that. Uh, so that was the, the question. I got it right. Uh, I felt real good as soon as I read that. I'm like, I know exactly what this is. Feeling real confident about that, hundred uh, percent. I'm guessing a lot of you got it too, but let me know in the comments below, especially if you didn't get it right. And what did you guess? Did you guess FBI or NSA? Or let me know what you guessed in the comments below. But uh, uh, let's go ahead and, and continue the discussion in the comments about documentary horror, uh, in particular these movies. If you've seen any of them, especially some of the more controversial ones, uh, let me know what your thoughts are on them, and let me know any other documentary horror movies that you think should have made the list. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue this conversation because I do love talking about these movies and I love talking to you guys. So we're gonna wrap it up this week but until next week class dismissed